And I think it's when you understand life insurance, especially when you overfund it with a proper company, you're getting close to those bond rate returns. And that makes yeah. sense because insurance companies are invested in a lot of the same things that bond, right. like, so you're getting almost bond rate returns, but right. you're getting a whole list of other benefits, including a death benefit, including yeah. chronic illness riders, including other benefits that in your financial life are an enhancer. If you were gonna have one takeaway from the book, it's that we can we can probably improve you know, the safety of your retirement, the cash flow of your in retirement using insurance products. Hey guys, it's Caleb Williams. With Hey everyone, welcome back to a very special episode of the Better Wolf Podcast. I am here with someone who has not written books on financial planning, has not is not a life insurance expert. In fact, this is uh, somebody who actually has been watching our content, and I kind of make a joke sometimes, especially when as it relates to this book right here, Doctor Wade Fowl. And I always I, I've thrown out a couple times if anyone is brave enough to read this entire book. <laughs> Uh, cover to cover yeah. and let me know what it what it means and wants to write a book report for me. Um, I just kind of jokingly say like, let me know. And and uh, I am interviewing somebody who is who is, I don't know, brave enough or dumb enough to raise their hand and say, hey, I'm I'm really interested in this. Uh, I, I got to, to meet you, Ethan, have many great conversations with you. You read this book cover to cover, yep. wrote an amazing one pager. Yeah. And uh, you don't, you're not in the life insurance business. You're not in the financial planning business. So no. you, my friend, are an anomaly and the first person <laughs> in the Better Wealth community that has done something like that. And so um, I'm very excited to host you on the show. Thank you so much. You're not the first person to call me an anomaly, but uh, maybe in a positive context. So thank you. Um, yeah, no, never, never um, sold a life insurance policy in my life. Never wrote a financial book. Just was interested in the topic and enjoyed your content. Uh, and so when you 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 said that in your video, like somebody, you know, somebody write me a book report or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I can do that. I So I'm really good. Well, we didn't even say this. I'm a college professor for a living. Um, so I've been through grad school and all that. So I've done a ton of writing. And I thought like, yeah, I can, I can write a book. I, I didn't know that... Um, it was going to be quite as in depth as Dr. Fowl went in, but uh, no, it was good. So thank you for I, having me. I, I personally know Dr. Fowl. He's oh. um, he's amazing. I've had the opportunity to interview him, and okay. he yeah, I've just learned so much from his teachings. Um, yeah. And I think a lot. I think he would even say like, "Hey, this book is not meant to be read by the everyday person. It's literally meant to be read by like people that are like expertise in the retirement." planning income space. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, he'll even, this will be a, bring a smile to his face to, to watch this and, and see this. But um, you did share a little bit about your background. I would love yeah. to just like go back and like, mm -hmm. who are you? I know that you're, you, you're a doctor as well, yeah. maybe not the one that works on people, but nope. um, from, from the college standpoint, would love to hear a little bit of your background. And then I would also love to hear like how you even got introduced and how did you stumble upon our content to begin with? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I'm a fellow Wisconsinite. Um, so that we had that in common. I'm from uh, Southern Wisconsin, grew up there in a small farming community. Um, oddly when I graduated high school, I was very done with school, just wanted to do my own thing. And, um, like many people that age kind of got a little bit of real life under their belt. And I thought, gosh, I don't, I don't have much of a plan here. <laughs> I, better, I better come up with a plan. So I ended up going back to school and then stayed in school forever. So as I told you, I've got bachelor's degree, two master's degree, an ABD doctorate. And um, it, that just means all but dissertation. And then my full doctorate from um, University of Wisconsin, Stout. So so a lot of education. And then I teach computer science um, at what I call the greatest college in the world, Nicolet Area Technical College in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. And I've been there for quite a while and I, and I love it. Um, in terms of like how I got to you, um, you know, I, I just enjoyed watching your content. And so that was, that was part of it. Uh, specifically with the life insurance aspect of it though, my wife is back in college now. Uh, so she is, she is going to be doing a new career. And so we went down to a single income and I was contributing the maximum to my retirement every year. 
And with going down to a single income, I thought, gosh, bank accounts going backwards kind of fast, you know? <laughs> so, so I don't, I don't, I was such similar to not having a plan after high school. I thought, gosh, if we have an emergency, I don't have much of a plan. Um, one of the, one of the downfalls at, at our college uh, anyway, um, and various employers, depending on what their policies are, is that you can't access the money in your retirement account um, unless it's an emergency that they deem an emergency. Uh, so, and in the event that they deem it an emergency, you have to fill out the paperwork and it's got to go through the process. And it's like, well, you know, if it's an emergency, I kind of need the money like soon, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I, so that's actually how I ended up becoming interested in life insurance. Um, and as you know, cash value life insurance, I should say more specifically, and as you know, there's a ton of misinformation out there and I get that you know, some people sell, this is how they put food on the table. And so naturally there's going to be a certain degree of hype that goes along with it because they're, they have the incentive of paying their rent and whatever. Um, so I reached out to several YouTubers and, and got, and, and even non YouTubers that I just found on the internet and got illustrations, life cash value, life insurance illustrations. And, um, even when I got the same product, the illustrations were very different. And I thought like, hmm, either I'm not understanding something or something's going on here. So so I just started digging in and doing research and trying to figure out like what's going on here? Why, why can't I get to the bottom of this? So I ended up getting a life insurance license and um, just doing a lot of research. And actually, I because I don't put food on the table this way. I just started calling different companies and I actually got to be friends with some people at Allianz and some people at Securian and a Nexus. And I could call them right now and just have a conversation. And, um, you know, they're cool. It, it's it, most of those people, there are just nice, cool people. Um, and their job actually isn't, they don't pay the bills by selling. It's like, they're the, they're the education people really. Yeah. And so eventually I got to the bottom of it. It's like, well, what's going on? And, and you guys, going back in your podcast, you guys have talked about this, but a lot of times it just boils down to, is it properly structured? Yeah. Um, and, uh, a lot of times you'll hear YouTubers or whoever say, or TikTokers say, you know, you've got to go with somebody who properly structures it. Interesting though, as many things in life are very nuanced, right? So properly structured is subject to gradation. <laughs> so you can have a really, really poorly structured or like a kindly, kind of poorly structured, like meh, this one's about 50, 50, you know? And so, um, one, one man's version of, of properly structured is not another man's version. And uh, so yeah. probably the more you've been looking into it, it's like the more frustrating it gets. I remember in my journey, it's yeah. like, I, I got a taste of like what it could be, yeah. but then it's like everywhere you turn, you're getting, you're hearing something different. Each company has a different interpretation. Yeah. And it becomes very frustrating. I'm I'm actually more curious because I know that yeah. I want to yeah. dive into your yeah. report. You yeah. called it the unbreakable bond. And I think it's I think it's brilliant what you've what you've summarized here from mm-hmm. what Dr. Wade Fowl wrote in his book. Mm-hmm. But before that, like what about life insurance? Like it's not a normal thing to just stumble upon. What what even made you go down this journey to begin with? Because yeah. for majority of people, it, I think it's the most misunderstood asset on the for financial professionals, because I think a lot of people represent it poorly. They represent it as an investment. They overhype it. And there's maybe reasons for that. But then I also think it's super hated. Um, mm-hmm. And and there there's misunderstanding there. And so I find myself in the middle. And a lot of times, someone who loves to be liked by everybody, I'm like, no one yeah. likes me. The the industry doesn't like me. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the, 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 I, it, trust me, it's like going out and being like a representing and talking about life insurance doesn't give you any like super fans out in the world. And yeah. so all that, all that to say, like, I've just found, like, I've had my own journey and I'm just curious, like what even made you reach out to people and get illustrations and look into it? There's had to be a, like a spark to why the life insurance. How did I get there? Yeah. yeah. So you, it's a good point. I didn't really drive the car around all the way when I was making that point earlier. Um, so back to the single income thing and not being able to get money out of the retirement account. Um, my can I found cash value life and I was looking up, I was doing research basically on where can I put my money to potentially have it grow, but then also be able to access it. 
Got it. And and so sorry, totally right. I missed a very important link there. And really, um, there's not that many. What other assets out there? I mean, you have a savings account, but the growth right. isn't that great. Right. And there's very other few assets that allow you to do those things yeah. well. Yep. Yeah. And there's some tax advantages to it, as you know. And yep. Um, there's a, a, as we talk about with the unbreakable bonds, like a greater degree of safety comparably to some other things. Uh, so that's what really that's what really drove me to that is I didn't want to be in this life where in this world where I was really drastically reducing what I was saving at work um, in fear of, you know, potential emergencies or whatever. So I thought like, okay, well, I, I, I always recommend, not that I'm a financial advisor, but I always recommend like, you should have some money away in a savings account that's just ready to go uh, all the time. But there's also a chunk of money that's sort of like my my like medium fear money. <laughs> like um, I, I might need it, but I might not. And I don't know if it's like great just sitting in my bank account. So that's, it's that piece that I really thought life insurance might be able to help me out. And, and I totally agree with you. It's very misunderstood. And, and quite honestly, from my perspective, it can be a pretty bad product. If, if people take advantage of you and don't do it well, it can be a pretty bad product. It can be a pretty great product if you keep it for a long time and it's properly structured and you have the proper expectations. And I think if I had one major criticism of the life insurance industry, it would be expectations and education. Yeah. And and here's here's why. Expectations, because as you know, it's like a pretty hyped, pretty hyped product. The other piece of that is the education piece is, well, it's hyped either because people know they need to sell it um, and they just want to make a sale or they don't really understand it, which which I which I do find frequently. Um people sell the product, but they, but maybe not, that might not be what they specialize in. And they just, they just don't fully understand it. Not, not everybody's out to take advantage of you. Um, some people yeah. just don't know what they don't know. We, so, so that's part of it too. So I think, I think what you've done has been really great is really setting the proper expectations because it can be a really good product. There's some really great advantages mm -hmm. to it. Uh, but if you set the proper expectations and set up a plan uh, I think you're in a, a much yeah. better place. And that's that's why I, I'm a broken record with it not being an investment. Yeah. Like, of course, it's not an investment, but I think a lot of the hype and the, the misunderstandings on both sides come from the, the paradigm that they're comparing it to an investment or yeah. they're, in some cases, making it sound like a better than your yeah. investments. Yeah. And I think that's where... That's where the that's where we go astray. And I think if you just understand life insurance as a protection asset yeah. that it is, and the other other benefits that you get, not just now, but in the future, it's like everyone, I believe, if understood, would want a portion of their portfolio and assets in it. If mm -hmm. again, if you if you want understood it and and you have to like yeah. you have to have a family that you love. Like there's gotta be yeah. other things that are also a part of the equation, but yeah. um that's you know, I, I appreciate you going backwards and before before taking on the challenge of of reading Dr. Wade's yeah. book, did was there any did you have any knowledge around how life insurance from an academic standpoint could be used in retirement? Or was it more of like this wall accumulating money? You wanted something like mid tier, like not super emergency, but mid tier, like safe, and then was reading um, you know, safety first in, in, in retirement, like the first time that it kind of like it, you reading from a paradigm of like not even caring about that, but more caring about retirement income and and what he talks about in the book. Yeah, so I, his his work was the first what I would call academic work that I actually read. Um, that being said, I would say that being having gone through as much grad school as I have, you're like my natural disposition. It's actually something that my wife hates about me is that I just look at everything analytically because um, one thing that they teach you and drive into your brain in grad school is like, get over yourself, get over your emotions. It's just, you, you if you say something, if you make a statement, you have to show me how you prove it and, and then show me the methodology that you used to prove it. 
Um, and so when, when we have conversations, I always say like, well, hmm, that's one way of looking at it, but have you looked at it like this? And she's like, shut up. Will you just agree with me? You know? And I'm like, yeah, sorry. Honey. So it's um, like, it's, it's like being a good, being a good husband versus being right. It's a, yeah. It's a <laughs> oh yeah. And I mean, so yeah, my default stance on almost everything is that I'm wrong. Another thing that gets drilled into your brain is like, just presume you don't know what you're talking about and then, and then try to prove it. Um, so Anyway, so I, I looked at stuff. I tried to look at stuff as critically and analytically as I could. It can be difficult if you don't if you do that outside of academia, strictly because a lot of it's a marketing piece. Even you know, even if you go to like carriers' websites, a lot of it's marketing stuff, right? So you have to sort of and if you're not in this industry, it's really their marketing is really good. <laughs> their marketing is very convincing, and so if you don't know how to interpret it properly that's true with anything right it's true with food it's true true with literally any industry you look at you have to like try to look at it as analytically as humanly possible yeah. and uh in, in any event um i think what dr fow's book did for me one thing that he did is he he came up with a lot of specific examples so throughout that book there's a there's a lot of numbers and a lot of data which is helpful but he also put it into a lot of specific um planning examples so it, it was it was interesting basically like his point the the point that he was getting at and people who follow that avenue of uh retirement planning is that basically there's a chunk of money that you're going to need let's say monthly uh no matter what and so the argument that they're making is for that chunk of money, we're just not going to take any risks, basically. So, so if you go to a, a what I would say a more traditional retirement planner, oftentimes they'll do something called Monte Carlo sim simulations, and uh, and where you put your money, and they'll say like, okay, well, we can meet your 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 goals with let's say an eighty five percent chance of of success, you know, and and eighty five percent is pretty high, right? Like. Right. Yeah, that's pretty good. But, but what if I hit the fifteen? <laughs> you know, like if I hit, you wouldn't the 15, be flying on an airplane with an eighty-five percent chance of landing. <laughs> right, that's just it. And so, um, the argument really is like, okay, so for for that for that piece of your retirement, for that piece of of you're like, you know, you need this money. We're just not even going to play around with that. We're we're just going to take the the as much risk out of it as we humanly possibly can. Um, there's, there's obviously always in everything, a certain degree of risk, but, um, you know, as I said earlier, everything's subject to gradation. And so we reduce that as much as we can. And so that's, that's really the argument and the perspective that he takes in that book. So that for me, to go back to your original question, that from an academic standpoint was solidified it more so for me than what I was able to get through some other resources. So the what you what you would say in in the summary because I know that we'll I'll get into your writing mm -hmm. in a second and mm -hmm. obviously in, anyone who wants to see Ethan's work you can check out the link below and and we're gonna give it to anyone who wants uh, to get the one pager of mm -hmm. this of this entire book and at least your interpretation of it but you yeah. would just say like uh, your summary of this whole entire book is there's um, essentially from a standpoint of using uh, reverse engineering retirement from a cash flow perspective mm -hmm. and saying like the typical way that people are doing retirement planning, there is some risk involved. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of unknowns and incorporating something like a life, life insurance, annuities, even like reverse mortgages yeah. into your retirement picture can increase your likelihood of success. And in some cases, uh, increase the cash flow that you're able to get because of those of those planning is is that like correct me where I went yep. astray, but I'm just trying to like summarize what you no, said. I, I I would I would I would agree. Um, it, you know, pres, you know, the presumption there being that the typical planner is you know the stocks and bonds planner or whatever, which I which I think pro, it's probably safe for us to say that, but I don't have any statistics in front of me. But um, it, from from yes, I would agree from his perspective of using life insurance like products to improve that cash flow and to reduce risk, P particularly. And and by the way, I just want to be clear: he is not against stock market investing. Yeah, he he's for it. He, the argument that he's making is you know particularly for the bonds piece 
what would traditionally perhaps be the bonds piece of your portfolio. The argument that he makes is, well, if you use life insurance products, we can we can be as effective and in many cases more effective um, from a cash flow standpoint with less risk. Yep. Yep. I think that's uh, th- think that's well said, and maybe that goes into your your piece um, called Unbreakable Bonds. Yeah. And in your one pager, you give an overview of who Dr. Wade Fowle is. Then you talk about longevity risk, market risk, spending, spending shocks, and then bond replacement. Yeah. So I'll let you kind of talk through the the one pager and kind of sure. what your thoughts were because i think yep. i remember us chatting and i think you had all kinds of different versions but i think you were like all right caleb if there's anything i know about caleb if it's like it's longer than one page he's probably uh not going to read it so yeah. <laughs> i don't well, know if that had anything to do with it but i i i think there's something beautiful about simplifying simplifying yeah. simplifying and so yeah. i appreciate the simplicity that you instilled over three was it 300 pages I think uh, it was 300 yeah. some 340 plus pages yeah. into one page. Yeah. Well, right. The, the hyper cliff notes version. Um, yeah. So I basically the perspective I came from was how many people are really going to read this book who, who aren't like financial planners or academics. And then I thought like, but this is actually really interesting, good information. And so just to boil it down to, to, the one page is the part of that one page is what we already talked about is like, if you were going to have one takeaway from the book, it's that we can, we can probably improve, you know, the safety of your retirement, the cash flow of your in retirement using insurance products um, properly. So that's, that's the major takeaway. But uh, another piece that I think just the everyday person probably doesn't think about very frequently. I didn't was the different risks associated with, um, with retirement. So like longevity risk is probably the most easy, easiest one to understand. It's just what if you live too long, (laughs) you know, like you say like, well, I'm planning to live to 85 years old. Well, okay. What happens if you live to a hundred? Are you, you have too much life at the end of your money, you know? So, so that's, that's a risk. So how do you, how do you address that risk? Well, you know, maybe you got lucky and the stock market just way outperformed your expectations. And you're like, okay, well, I can, I can meet that gap. Okay. Well, if that doesn't happen, what other types of products can help fill that gap? So, you know, the thing you probably immediately think about is an annuity. Annuity sticks around as long as you stick around, depending on, on what product you bought. Um, Market risk is another one, but, but market risk is more complicated I think then people often get credit for, because I'll give you an example. Let's say that the market, um, well, the easiest example is just like the market doesn't perform. It underperforms. Okay. Yep. That one's easy to understand, but there's something called sequence of returns risk. And basically that's how the market performs at a particular time. So even if the market over say a long period of time returned, a reasonable rate of return. If it goes south or sideways when you need the money and you have a lot of assets tied up in that, you have no real control over that, right? So it goes back to what Dr. Fowl was saying is, all right, well, for the money you know you're going to need, no matter what, rain or shine, we need to like remove more of that, more of that risk out of there. And then the other one, the other big one he talked about was spending shocks, which, you know, for retirement age people probably is mostly healthcare, but the car breaks down, you got to move, like what, whatever. Everybody has these unexpected expenses, you know, not dissimilar to, you know, I'm not near retirement age, but not dissimilar to me really, right? I was trying to plan for a spending shock. I was trying to figure out like, what can I do for a spending shock? Because I don't want to be in the situation where I need money and I have to convince someone to give me my own money. Yeah. And, and I didn't want to be in that situation. So, so yeah, so those are, those are the things that really stuck out to me. And then in terms of the, the bond replacement piece, I learned a lot about bonds in this cause I, I didn't know that much about bonds. Um, but, but for those who don't know, and I apologize, probably a lot of the people listening to this do know, I'm probably just boring them, but I wouldn't assume, I, I think <laughs> bonds are one of these, like I went, I went to college, had a whole um, college class on on stocks and bonds and trust me no one in that class knew what a bond was at the end so okay. you're, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that you can share whatever you want to share and it'll be valuable okay so so 
bonds are kind of interesting. They, they, you know, essentially you give a company or some, some entity money and they promise to pay you an interest rate and, and the principal value back. So not terribly difficult to understand and certainly inherently generally less risky than, than a stock, but different bonds are rated differently. So you may have heard the term junk bonds, for example. So, so generally those bonds have higher interest rates because you are taking on a greater degree of risk. That's essentially part of it. Now, now the most, the safest bonds, which aren't actually called bonds would be like a treasury note, for example, um, which is backed by the United States government. So if there's a default on that, then we have way bigger fish to fry than whether you got paid back on your, <laughs> on your uh, treasury note. Um, but in any event, the, the point that Dr. Fowl made was that there, there's there's interest rate risks associated with bonds. Uh, the the price of a bond or the, what's called the face value of a bond fluctuates based on interest rates. So uh, as an example, let's say you buy a bond um, and the interest rate is, I don't know, 3% or whatever, but then the interest rate goes up, the face value of your bond actually decreases. And the reason for that is because as interest rates go up, they pay a higher interest rate on the bond. So naturally, investors going to want to buy the bond that gives it, that offers a higher interest rate. So if if you are in a financial situation where you can keep the bond to maturity, and um, presuming that the debtor pays you back, um, then then you're okay. You come out okay. But if you need the money and you have to sell your bond at a discount, like that's a bummer, right? So uh, things like cash value, life insurance, and annuities are not subject to the same degree of, of that and just because of the nature by which they're, they're structured. Um, so, but it, it all boils down back to what we were talking about is like just mitigating as much risk as you, as you possibly can. Did well, that make sense? Hopefully it made yeah, sense. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about a bond, uh, the okay. typical way that people think of a portfolio, and again, this is not investment advice. We're not, mm -hmm. we're just, entertaining entertaining you on youtube right mm -hmm. um the the concept of it is you have stocks that have more upside but more mm -hmm. downside it's the more vol volatile and then mm -hmm. bonds are kind of like the the uh more you know they they'll make a joke of like it's just really boring it's like yeah. it's like watching paint dry kind of deal and and actually recently with interest rates going up it's yeah. obviously created it's been worse for the bond market like you like what you said but overall the idea is bonds kind of like help balance out your yeah. stock portfolio and the more the older that you get the more quote unquote conservative you get you create more bond holdings and less stock holdings because you you don't have like when you're uh, in your 60s 70s you may not have the 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 stomach or the risk tolerance than maybe what you do in your 20s or 30s right now when you look at what a bond is and then you start thinking like, what, what is a different asset that we could potentially replace the bond with? Mm -hmm. And this is really for me, it's like when you have that mindset of like, okay, I'm not bad mouthing or bashing anything. It's like, I, mm -hmm. like, hey, if you believe yeah. that the stock market is the best way for you to grow your, and invest for the long term, that's, that's great. Yeah. Let's look at like, like, let's compare stocks and is there anything that can replace stocks? And in this case, let's look at bonds and say, is there any asset out there that could potentially be better than a bond. Yeah. And I think it's when you understand life insurance, especially when you overfund it with a proper company, you're getting close to those bond rate returns. And that makes yeah. sense because insurance companies are invested in a lot of the same things that bond, right. like, so you're getting almost bond rate returns, but right. you're getting a whole list of other benefits, including a death benefit, including yeah. chronic illness riders, including other benefits that, in your financial life are an enhancer. It's yeah. like, that's, that's why we call it the and asset because it gives it multiple jobs. Whereas I could argue that a bond is maybe more like one dimensional. Yes. Whereas a life insurance policy is multidimensional. And then the question is, are, is your portfolio better having a properly designed life insurance policy in it or a bond in it? And that's, that's where yeah. I would love the conversation to go is like, Hey, yeah. like, you choose, but if people really understood the pros and cons, I think a lot of people would be like, hey, I like the life insurance element, not just for me while I'm alive, but it's actually going to be better when I pass away and I don't need to choose between, a tra it's not, there's no trade-off if you properly yeah. structure it. And I think, I think too, I, I totally agree. I think too, like pres also presuming you have a, a reasonable time horizon that that value proposition even gets considerably better. 
Um, there's, there's going back to safety. Uh, one thing I just want to point out too, is like, we talked about this a little bit too. Some people I, I've heard the, um, criticism that like, well, life insurance is, you know, expensive. There's a lot of fees and stuff up front and which, which argue, I, I can't argue with that. Yeah. Up front, it is, it's pretty pricey. Like that's, that's the product, but, but also bear in mind, like we talked about this a little bit before, like what is insurance? It's, it's, you're paying for the transfer of risk. Okay. Yep. So, so it's not, this isn't an exact analogy, but I was sort of, sort of brainstorming on this. I thought like, I'm, I kind of do that with my Roth IRA, you know? So, so here's the example I, I'm paying now, I'm paying now because I want to transfer the risk of tax rates in the future. Good point. It's a really good point. And, and because I don't, I don't want to take on that risk. And so, so Ethan knows, Ethan's very aware that, um, a hundred year old life insurance company almost certainly is going to do a better job of putting my money in places that's going to work effectively for me, presuming that I structure it properly on the front end, go with the proper company and, and am with them long enough to get those advantages. So if you look at your internal rate of return, like on an illustration, um, particularly over a long period of time. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I don't think three and a half, four and a half percent is unheard of for a, a well-structured life insurance policy and, that has living benefits, you know? I yeah. Mean, yeah. So, and, and I just want to point out, like we're right now comparing to very high interest rates when you look at the last right. couple of years right? and like life insurance, it's like worse than bond market. It's like super slow, yeah. but it's like, if, if interest rates are going to continue to stay where they are, I think it's, I think it's pretty clear that life insurance companies will follow. Um, and sure. so we also have to could say like, even before like interest, when interest rates were lower, these were where the rates were yeah. just to, just imagine, you know, over 10 years, if, if interest rates don't adjust and again, this is all speculation, but it's, it's right. just going back to what you said of like, you look through that and you, when you understand the living benefits, it's actually not like, it's actually a very reasonable why someone would want this as a part of their portfolio. Mm -hmm. And interest rates generally, it's a little counterintuitive, but higher interest rates generally are beneficial to life insurance companies. So yeah. a great example is if you look at, if you look at annuities, if you look at um, IULs, participation rates for many companies have gone up significantly. Well, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons for that. But one of, one of the reasons is that they get more interest on, on their investments, right? So they can pay it forward more. And, and, and life insurance companies are in competition with each other and they want the client to have the best experience they possibly can. So they get more clients and ultimately make more money and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if you, if you look at it objectively, I, I think it's pretty competitive. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Ethan, is yeah. there any, anything else that you want to, to share about, what you've been, what you've been learning. And I, I, again, want to thank you so much for, for coming on and yeah. I'm just really, really grateful. And I hope this is inspiring for people that are maybe watching, uh, in the shadows or have watched <laughs> our content. And if you have something to add, if you have a question, like I'm launching on a whole new series called naked numbers. And I like, I want to be answering questions. I want to have more dialogue. And I think I just, I want to do more of this. And so I just, I just really appreciate you yeah. commenting because this came from a YouTube comment and now you're on the show and I just I really appreciate that. Yeah. Hey, the best part about this is that I got to make a new buddy, fellow Wisconsinite, and that's just kind of been fun to chit chat. Um, so, so I don't know that I have, well, I guess the general comment I would have is just on anything. Um, you know, my battle as an educator is the battle against absolutism. Uh, life is very nuanced. So in, I would encourage everyone in their life to just look at things as nuanced as possible. And, and particularly as it comes back to this arena, there's a lot of absolutism in finance for sure. Like I, if you go back to like, you know, I know you're a fan of Dave, Dave Ramsey. I, I actually, my, a buddy of mine from college used to work for Dave Ramsey. Actually he said he was a great guy, but I think he's one, one, he's very general advice, right? So he's, he's, he's giving out very generic advice and you and I both know he hates life insurance, <laughs> life insurance. Um, and so I would just like, 
I would just say not specifically just finance, but just everything in your life. Try to be as analytical as possible. Try to try to break things down and and use critical thinking as much as you can because um, you know I I think you ultimately can get to better outcomes that way. Um, do you care if I ask you a question, Caleb? Yeah, no, fi- fire away. The one thing I just will point out on yeah. that is. I think uh, a lot of times we don't even, we're not even asking the right question. So it's Agreed. like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally appreciate you're like, things are more nuanced. Let's be more analytical yeah. or just actually figure out what you want and, and like be open-minded to yes. like, maybe what you want, maybe you need to quit your job. Like, I just always think of like big picture, like some people are like, doing everything they can to hold on to a job, but that the job mm-hmm. is holding them back to live the life that they want. Or, mm-hmm. you know, this, you could literally break out in any sector uh, or conversation, sure. but it's like some people are like looking at, how do I get a better rate of return when they're actually asking the wrong question? And yes. so that's why we're a big fan of like, what do you really want? That's a good And point. then let's look at your time. Let's look at your money. Let's look at your relationships. Let's, let's look at your talents and like, let's put together a strategy on how to make yeah. that happen. And I just like, that's where I like, sometimes that can come across wooey. And I don't know from your perspective, cause like you're very like um, it, it, analytical, but like yeah. for me, it's just, I've seen so many people like almost be analytical and that's good, but they're like, they're not zooming out. And I think they're, it, it needs to constantly zoom out, zoom in, zoom out, zoom in. Cause I just find that some people are way too big picture and they have no substance, sure. but then some people are like literally in the weeds yeah. and they're, they're in the wrong weed patch. Sure. No, good point. I actually, um, it's funny, I, you know, just my nat- my personality aligns more with this, but what you just said actually to me is kind of analytical. And, and let me give you an example. So um, when you're writing a dissertation, um, it is it, one thing you learn quickly is how hard it is to write a good question. It's impossibly difficult, particularly when it comes to surveys. It is, there's, there's actually people who literally make a living writing survey questions for researchers because it's so hard because you have to elicit the proper response. You have to make sure you're getting the exact answers that you're actually looking for. So to me, what you're talking about is are, are you, when, you're, when you're saying, are you asking the right questions? Are you, if you don't know the right question, how are you ever going to get to the right conclusion? Um, yeah, so good. no, I think, I think that's, I think that's awesome. So here's my question and feel free to edit this out. This doesn't have to be part of the interview, but I, I, I assume if I'm curious, other people are going to be curious. So the first time that we chit chatted, you were, I just think you're an amazing guy because you're so young and you've, you've already developed this business and come so far. You said you at 19, right? You were the, you investment manager at a bank. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the person that was running our bank left or person running the investment department of our bank left. And I, I took over as the interim and, okay, you know, was there for um, a couple of years until leaving to start better wealth. Okay. Well, that was my question because I was, I was thinking about this and something kind of similar happened to me. I, um, I was, I worked at a radio station in high school and um, I became the web designer and solely because I was a teenager and the boss was like, well, kids know about web design, right? <laughs> and so, um, and, and I'm not suggesting that's what happened to you, but what I was thinking is like, I wonder if he was just in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And that's, and that's great. I'm not taking anything away from you. Clearly a bright, capable person. You no, know, I mean, I, I so, share very publicly. I, yeah. I think uh, I heard this once and it made a ton of sense to me is in good to great it's a book on leadership highly recommend Mm -hmm. he talks about views on luck and if you look at my life i got extremely lucky or blessed however you want to call Mm -hmm. it and there's many i could i could point back to like 10 at like the fact that i got a job without applying at a bank because i knew because my mom knew somebody who was friends with a person that happened to be on the board and I was like so nervous at the time meeting this person that my mom like helped me write down yeah. questions. Yeah. Like this is like a lot of people, like if you go back 10 years, you would not recognize me. Um, sure. And so it's like, I look back on that. It's like crazy. Um, yeah. But then the, the idea of it's like everyone gets lucky in their life. It's just what For you sure. do with it. And I like yeah. the concept of increasing your luck surface because mm. when I, there's a lot of people that get jobs at a bank 
Yeah. What I did though, if you look at it, like how I actually, what I actually did when I was at the bank is I became obsessed. I, mm-hmm. I don't want to get them in trouble, but like I would, I, I would work the hours that they told me to work and then I would work for free after mm-hmm. I'd be calling the, the CEO of the bank on the weekends talking about how we could be more profitable as a bank, as yeah. a teller. I, yeah. When the CEO would come into town, we would go out to dinner and we would brainstorm. <laughs> I would sit in on meetings for free if they yeah. allowed me to, because I want to learn more about the loan department. I was writing radio ads. I was, I was showing up to networking events and I didn't even have cards. So I'd write my name on the back of other people's cards. Sure. And sure. so all that to say is, yeah, unheard of, got extremely lucky and blessed. Yeah, But I also, I think the principle is wherever you are, um, I could have taken multiple jobs that would have paid me way more money in my eight, you know, 17, 18, 19. And I turned those down consistently because I knew that the bank was the best um, foundation for me to build what I ultimately wanted to help, like my goal is to help people see and reach their highest potential. So I think, I think it's like, like, you're right, because it's very analytical, like it was very... I, I was very intentional about the decisions I was mm-hmm. making and, and people, including my mom was like, man, you should ask for a raise and all these things, mm-hmm. or you should maybe go get another job that, and for me, I, and again, they had great intentions, but they were looking at the, the money to, to time ratio, which yeah, I was right. probably like $3 an hour. If you actually think about <laughs> yeah, it. Right. And, and for me, I was just like, well, I'm just like literally investing in myself. Yeah. And this is yeah. like, I'm given the greatest opportunity because I'm, I get opportunities that people don't get for 20 years out of college, depending on what route right. they go. So right. great question. And you, if you have more questions, but like, that is the, I don't get to share a lot about that, but that was very much the mindset during yeah. that time. Well, yeah, I, I think that just speaks to like, just who you are as a person, but I, I mean, not, not terribly dissimilar to, um, you know, I got obsessed with, this whole life insurance thing. Cause I just, I just, for some reason that really got its claws into me and I felt like I had to learn more about it. And then I, very cool of you too, to respond to me. Thank you. I know you're a busy guy. So it was, it was fun, mutual, um, to just to conversate about stuff like that. And, um, particularly a fellow Wisconsinite, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty neat. And your old office in Stevens point, as I told you, right down the road from Coldstone, my favorite restaurant. Right. We, <laughs> so, we, yeah, Coldstone, uh, noodles, noodles we, yeah. Starbucks is like the second office. And so it, lots Starbucks of, is the second lots office. Of sure. Memory. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. That's an awesome story. I just, I just, I often wondered that and, um, about just kind of your journey, because I think a lot of people probably, I mean, I would presume look at you and go like, gosh, this guy's pretty young. How did he, how did he get there? And, I mean, you obviously worked your butt off to get there. I mean, that's that's clear. But um, yeah, I think you made a really great point about when an opportunity presents itself, how do you respond to it? So. Yeah. Cool. Well, Ethan, thank you so much for mm-hmm. coming on the show. This Is this your very first podcast you've been on? This, I, you know, yeah. You make it sound like there's going to be more. Yes, this was my very first podcast ever. If I would love to be on another podcast, this is actually super fun. So I used to, as I said, I used to work in radio. So I used to be on on radio all the time. So I love um, chit chatting with people, and this was just really fun. Well, I'll I'll just put a plug in um, in the comments. Let us know your thoughts, and I know I won't speak for Ethan, but I know that he may have a, a future book, may have a future course. This might not be the last podcast he go, goes on. So uh, just love to hear your thoughts. And obviously this in, in, um, this all started from a, from a YouTube comment. And so um, just, just appreciate you, Ethan, and what you're yeah. doing and the person that you are. Thank you for this. If you're interested in getting the one pager that Ethan put together, we'll have a link down below where you can grab that. Um, and, and, we're, uh, we're not far. We're easy to reach. So please, please let me know if you have questions. And if you're interested in coming on the show, we'll have links down below on all of that. If you're interested in learning more about life insurance, we, we call it the and asset. We have a link down below where you can learn more about that. And um, Ethan, I don't know if you have any final words. I usually end the podcast by asking if this was your last day on earth, what, what, yeah. would, the, what would you say to the people that you love the most? Is there anything that you want to yeah. share before we go into that last and final question? Um, so before we go into that last and final question, I just wanted to say thank you for having me. And also to everybody who happened to watch this, um, 
thank you very much for watching it because it was really fun and without you this opportunity doesn't exist so um that's it okay so the last question is what do i say on yeah on my you, last day your on last earth? day on earth you're with the people that you love the most you yeah. can be as analytical and nuanced as you want um <laughs> yeah what do you okay. say to the people that you love the most so i'm going to start with i'm going to start with what i hope they say about me and and because it's going to curtail into what i would say to them so i think i would hope that people my loved ones would say that ethan was endlessly curious occasionally funny and always kind um i don't know was mr rogers before your time or did you i, I remember a few but yeah, I, okay. I couldn't quote him at all okay so here's a quote so mr rogers mr rogers neighborhood pbs show for kids um a really interesting guy but but he said i'm gonna paraphrase a little bit he said um there's three secrets to ultimate success and he said the first one's to be kind the second one is to be kind and the third one's to be kind and I just really took that to heart and I thought, yeah, I, it's probably right. You know, that's kind of all we have. Uh, and so what I would ultimately say to my loved ones is, you know, I hope, I hope I served you well. And, um, I hope that whatever you learned from me, hopefully kindness, you can pay that forward. That's beautiful. That's Thanks. beautiful. I, I think of your students who may have failed test. <laughs> Yeah. And then they watch this and be like, hey, professor, we need uh, some kindness. Yeah, <laughs> so, we need a little. So we'll see. We'll see if anyone used that beautiful answer and wise answer uh, to 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 help them get by in school. Ethan, thank you. And I, yeah. I look forward to future conversations. Thanks, Caleb. Bye-bye.